great pleasure to me, for me to introduce tonight's speaker, Claes de Fresse, I've been told. That's how you should pronounce it. Who is professor and chair of political communication at the Amsterdam School of Communication Research at the University of Amsterdam. He's also affiliated professor of political science and journalism at the University of Southern Denmark in Odense. Professor uh, de Fresse is the founder director of the Center for Politics and Communication. From 2011 to, to 2017, he was adjunct dean of the Faculty of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Between 2005 and 2013, he was the director of the Amsterdam School of Communication Research, ASCOR, and the director of the Netherlands School of Communication Research, NESCOR. ASCOR is one of the largest social science research institutes in communication science in the world. He is a member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences and chair of the Social Science Council. He is also a fellow of the International Communication Association, ICA. In 2004, as Sigmund said, he was the first young scholar to receive the Niels Krim Prize, which is awarded to Nordic scholars under the age of 35 for outstanding research in the arts and humanities, social sciences, law, and theology. Since he received his prize in 2004, Claes de Fresse's academic career has been exceptionally successful. De Fresse's CV, counting all of 35 pages today, <laughs> which documents all of his endeavors, is far too long to cite in detail, and he is still a fairly young man. Suffice it to mention that to date, his list of publications includes 10 books and well over 150 peer-reviewed articles in well-renowned international journals, including journals such as Journal of Politics, um, Political Communication, and Public Opinion Quarterly, and a mass of others that I won't have time to read up to you. He is also, <clears throat> he has been uh, the editor-in-chief of political communication since 2014, and he served as editor and editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Public Opinion Research, uh, IJPOR. Today, he serves on the editorial board of several ICI-ranked journals and reviews manuscripts for over 40 journals in journalism, communication science, political science, and European studies. Professor de Fresse's research interests include comparative journalism research, the effects of new public opinion and European integration, effects of information and campaigning on elections, referendums and direct democracy. His research has been funded through a number of large prestigious research grants of which he is principal investigator, such as Europinions, a European Research Council grant from 2015 to 20, as well as Veni and Vici grants from the Dutch Science Foundation. In addition to the Niels Klim Award, Claes de Freese is the recipient of almost 20 additional international awards, prizes, and recognitions, among them awards by the Danish Science Foundation and the International Communication Association. The title of de Vries's talk tonight is Dealing with Populism, a Challenge for the New Media. Professor de Frese, the floor is yours.
with an uh, introduction like that, uh, the contents of what will follow can almost only inevitably fall a bit short. Uh, let me start by uh, thanking you all for being here tonight and also for uh, inviting me to speak at this, uh, at this event. Um, needless to say that back in 2004, it was a big honor uh, and also a big surprise to receive the call from Bergen uh, to be informed that I was the first laureate of the, of the junior prize. Uh, I'm actually very grateful to uh, the Norwegian uh, government. I think they did something very bold. Um, and something with the benefit of hindsight uh, that other countries could learn from, namely to try and focus on the social sciences and humanities and its sister disciplines uh, as areas in which uh, there is a lot of important research taking place, which is probably some of the biggest impetus for understanding today's uh, societies. Um, in many countries, these areas struggle in terms of receiving recognition, in terms of receiving funding. And it is wonderful to see a government at, uh, at a point in time to take such a bold decision to recognize and to seek laureates coming from exactly these disciplines. So I think that there's a, a great uh, part of me that re really recognizes um, the bold decision of the Norwegian government back in, in 2003. I thought what more appropriate topic to talk about at a festive event uh, like today than the topic of populism. Um, nothing seems more appropriate for a reception party than uh, talking about uh, the wave of populism that many Western democracies is experiences in, in recent years. Um, let me start by saying that populism comes in many shapes and forms. Uh, while it is on the increase, it is by no means the case that it is increasing linearly in terms of its popularity. And if you look at some of the uh, photos here known to both the Norwegians and the Dutch, as well as other uh, nations in the room, you see that they uh, come at different continents. What I've wanted to do in my uh, work in the past, while I was a visiting fellow at the Shorenstein Center at the Kennedy School at Harvard University, was to try and translate some of the abundance of research that we actually have in the social sciences and the humanities into practical advice for journalists. This is uh, new for me. Uh, I don't usually do that, but that is why I wanted to share it with you. Uh, it was a very interesting experience to go through, to be forced to try and translate some of the insights from diverse fields such as communication science and psychology and sociology and political science into direct and concrete advice. But let's first talk a little bit about what I mean when I talk about populism. I talk about it as a communication phenomenon, not so much as a categorization of some actors being inherently populist and others not. If you look at the, by now, relatively broad literature of what populism is as a communication phenomenon, three elements really stand out as being at the very core of, of populism. First of all, that populist actors represent themselves as uh, representatives of the people. They oftentimes fail, by the way, to define who that people is, but that they speak in name of the people. They speak in the name of the people against a often elite or a, a corrupt uh, and dysfunctional elite. That is the second element of a, um, a strategy that cuts across different types of populism, whether it is more towards the left wing or the right wing of the political spectrum doesn't really matter, but these two elements are really at the core representative of the people and up against this uh, horrible and corrupt elite. And then there's a third element that has to do with exclusionism, which can also come in different shapes and form. It can be exclusion only for the native community of a country or region. It can be exclusive for groups such as the working class against the uh, corrupted banking system. But these three elements, if you start looking at it, and that is what other colleagues have done across the globe, are three elements that appear again and again when looking at populism as a communication phenomenon. There's a vast majority or a vast um, um, a body of, of research out there that tries to look at the causes of, of the populist upsurge in recent years. And many of these come uh, from uh, core um, fields in the social sciences. Um, economic conditions uh, is a feeding ground. The globalization movement is a feeding ground. Uh, there is a rich literature in political science that looks at both the supply and the, the demand of a populist rhetoric in different contexts. We know that the electoral system is a major impetus for the popularity of populists. Let's put it this way. Uh, 
It is because of the electoral system that you saw Brexit and Trump, and it is because of the electoral system that we are yet to see a uh, populist leader gain an absolute majority in a, a representative um, democracy in Western Europe. But a big question, of course, also is that if it is the case that one of the things that populists have in common is that they use specific communicative elements, well, that would lead us to consider the role of the media, and in particular journalism, as a major arena for us to look at better, to see what kind of platforms are offered to them and how they deal with journalism and media as such. Suffice also to say that the media landscape in recent years at the same time, not talking about causality necessarily here, but at the same time as we have seen the upsurge in populism has also changed dramatically. And if you look not only at changes in the average population, but break it down uh, by age, um, some of us in this room would maybe be really shocked to see what the level of readership is of newspapers uh, in today's age bracket under 30. But at the other hand, they consume news and information in places that most of us only got to learn uh, or have not not even start uh, to discover yet. So in the presentation for tonight, I am offering you 10 recommendations of what should journalism and the media actually do when posed with this uh, populist challenge. These 10 recommendations all stem from research, and uh, I do have a paper that I'm more than willing to share with me, but uh, for tonight, have faith in the evidence being there from uh, across the social sciences uh, and the humanities. So the first recommendation is, in fact, to do and pretend as if this is business as usual. There's great research in political science that shows the negative consequences of isolating and neglecting new political actors in the field. That can have backfire consequences both for journalism and the media by them being seen as elitist themselves and not giving a forum uh, to a broad variety of voices. And we have also seen in cases such as the Flams block in the beginning uh, that it can actually contribute to the popularity of these actors. So the first recommendation would be to, to treat and to cover politics as usual. At the same time, and that's where the recommendations, of course, get a bit fussy, I would also offer the opposite recommendation to journalism. That is based on the fact that what journalism does really well under normal circumstances is to try and create balance and coverage. However, with all kinds of new political actors and political movements, whether they are left-wing or right-wing, or populist in nature or not, there is a tendency that this balance requirement leads to a what has been dubbed the false equilibrium, uh, that some views are given equal attention, despite the fact that they might only be held by 15% of the elites or elected members of parliament, or maybe only be shared by 20% of the general population. There's a clear and urgent need for journalists to provide that kind of context and also to reconsider whether this false equivalence uh, is a danger when covering new actors. Third advice, research has shown that many citizens are not necessarily happy with the type of news that they get during uh, election times. There is a stark focus on opinion polls, who is ahead and who is behind in the game. And the challenge of today's uh, populism is that part of this frame, part of this way of covering politics is leading into governing. Uh, the Trump presidency is obviously the prime example uh, uh, right now, where the uh, coverage that is being offered of US politics in in the era where we should see the governing is too close to what we see during election time. This has a potential negative effect because we know that that emphasis on the polls and who is behind and ahead in the game increases political, citizens, uh, political cynicism amongst the electorate. So the fourth recommendation, also based on research, is don't focus too much on meta coverage as the media industry has become one of the core industries uh, of our societies, there's also been an increasing attention in the news media themselves to the news industry. Uh, that is in itself maybe not so bad, but it is problematic when uh, called the enemy of the state that the media take to the rescue of making that a big story about themselves and how uh, they are being challenged. Um, this kind of coverage, which has this meta coverage, and again focusing maybe on a strategic game rather than on political substance, we know from research, both experimental research and survey-based research, that it causes political cynicism. Don't 
chase every shining object is a uh, fifth advice to journalism. Um, <laughs> Journalist schools train their journalists and they do so diligently to be skeptical and to be critical of things such as press releases and corporate promotional material. If journalists at the political uh, newsroom use uh, um, politicians' tweets uh, and take them into the news coverage as leading elements of the, of the news coverage, they do a disservice to the profession itself. They should be treating tweets and these kind of utterances in no different ways than they treat press releases and commercial corporate material. We know uh, what the downsides are when tweets get leading, um, and this is one of the core reasons for why some populist actors in some countries have been so successful using social media, not so much because of social media themselves, but because of the magnifying glass role that traditional media have played in this respect by offering them front pages and the opening of the evening news. When the United States president calls the media the, a public enemy in the United States, that is something to be taken serious. At the same time, this is not the invitation for journalists um, to uh, enter into a game of pointing out relentlessly that everything that comes from the White House or from other populist actors, that that is uh, not factually correct. We know from a vast literature in social psychology on correcting misinformation and misperception that this is very hard to do. Once something is said, it's actually very us, even though we are of good will, to try and correct that in our memory. That said, we also know from that very same research that being very factual about correction mechanisms is the best strategy. So not an endless, pathetic sobbing about the fact that journalists are being offered incorrect information all the time. I don't think that that has ever been different. But a factual correction of the, uh, the non-facts is actually the best strategy. This is one of those examples where social science research can actually inform journalism. On the very first slide, you saw a number of countries in which you have seen an upsurge of populism uh, in the past 15 years. It is important for journalists to realize when they cover uh, populist actors that they are most likely not the first ones to do this ever. Uh, in the run-up to the Dutch election of last year, uh, the country was invaded uh, by international press. The reason being uh, that there was an idea that after the uh, Brexit referendum and the Trump election in the United States, that we would enter into a spring of sort of falling liberal democracies across Europe. Um, it does great disservice when journalists fail to contextualize and tell about populism in other countries, to tell about political entrepreneurs that have been successful and what some of the strategies have been in these countries, and rather treat every single election as a unique case. So the need to contextualize is big and imminent. Journalism can shape up. Uh, we know that from uh, uh, research in public administration and political science that the notion of legitimacy is something that is not only inherent to the institutions that we work for, but is also something that has very strong communicative elements in them and that actually have to be maintained over time. In a situation where journalism and the media are under fire, making sure that this kind of legitimacy is also being earned as a profession is important, and that entails being much more transparent about how journalism works. Uh, you see newspapers such as the New York Times and others starting to provide much more uh, information about how they actually compose studies, uh, compose their stories. Why do they use certain sources and not others? What have they tried to do in the make of this story that failed? This type of information is important if journalism wants to claim relevance in today's overflow of information. Insisting on details, explanation, justifications should be the core and hallmark of journalism. It cannot be the case that new political entrepreneurs enter the scene and are not challenged when they have brick and bold plans. If walls are to be built, if groups of people are not to come, if economies are to run differently, journalism must ask the question of how that budget then looks, what the parameters are, what the reasons are. This insistency of uh, on detail and on justification is one that is, comes very strong out of the literature also where journalism has failed in the, fall, uh, in the, in the past. Um, if political actors claim to be operating in the interest of the people, 
it must also be the task of journalism to question not only who that people is, but also which interests are really being taken care of under these circumstances. Finally, the press has been called anything from Lügenpresse to uh, fake news uh, and outright a state enemy. We know that when journalists bash politicians, and that is how the profession was made, that that can backfire on politicians. It is a risky business for journalists these days on how to operate, but there is a great need for them to make sure that there is a public awareness that rises on the qualities and the value of an actual free press. The way to do that is maybe not a continuous battle against the very political leads that has declared you the enemy, but to be non-combatant when, be when called an actual enemy. So, will these 10 rules solve the crisis or the challenge, or what some consider the welcome corrective to representative democracies that we are going through right now? Obviously not. But my attempt here tonight and my attempt in, in, in the writings that, I, that I've just completed was to try and take some of the insights that you can pull across very different disciplines in the social sciences and the humanities to offer actual and concrete advice to be used in newsrooms when faced with the challenge of a changing political landscape. The journalism and the news media today are not only facing a new business in which they operate, but they are also, uh, they are also facing a big change on the uh, supply side in terms of the political entrepreneurs with whom they have to deal. I hope that I've also tonight given just a little glimpse of why I like the field of political communication so much. It is a wonderful, ever-changing arena, uh, which is truly interdisciplinary in nature and operates right in the intersection between communication science, media studies, sociology and political science as part of uh, psychology. We are venturing into working together with information lawyers and uh, people from the uh, information sciences. Uh, th so this is an ever-changing uh, uh, arena for research, um, one that I hope to work in many years from now. But I did want to conclude by also thanking the Holberg Prize for being an impetus and being a very early recognition of this area of research. Uh, coming from the area of communication science, uh, Pearl was joking right before uh, we, we started tonight that, of course, there is a hierarchy and a history in the social sciences, too. And uh, without going into detail about uh, her observations, suffice to say that the field of communication science is a relatively new, young, a new one. Um, and it was therefore a great opportunity to be the first laureate from such a field uh, to win the Niels Klim Prize and later on being the first representative of that field to enter into the Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences. So thank you very much for that and that's where I leave it for tonight. Thank you. De Vreze, thank you so much. He has agreed to take a few questions, so if the audience would like to interact with him, yes. My name is Peter Drunt. Last night I saw a movie, The Post, mm -hmm. and it depicts the conflict between uh, political power and responsibility for the publisher to take its own course. I wonder why you did not include as the one and most important criteria that you just listed uh, the courage to defend free press against political pressure. There's no doubt um, that the autonomy of the press is one of the most precious uh, elements of the press and that is also why it is so interesting that in the past 10 years one of the enemies that have been chosen by the upsurge is the incumbent or, or, or the existing press system. Uh, they are being depicted as being part of this illeg illegitimate and corrupt elitist system. Um, it is, goes without saying that maintaining that is one of the core values of liberal democracies. But it is not the press itself that must create that. It is very much politics that must create the uh, opportunities for the press to be an autonomous press. It is very much a citizenry. It is very much a part of us as educators to make sure that there is a reappreciation of the value of a free press. We've been going through a period of time in which the free press for the past 60 years in most Western democracy has been taken for granted. 
we are now at a period of time where we are having discussions that we have not had in Western Europe since the 1930s on the role of a free press. But it is not the role of the free press to fight this battle for us. It is the role of people like us, it is the role of politicians to make sure that there is a system in which the free press can, can thrive. And publishers should always publish, even though the, the <laughs> referring to the movie. Still, I'm glad that Kay took the decision to uh, <coughs> defend the freedom against uh, McNamara and all their, all their friends in sure. the political uh, yeah. arena. Yeah. But we can't rely on them to also take that battle. Yeah. Anybody okay. else? Hi, yes. Just yes. You started out with an observation at the beginning, which I think is uh, extremely important, that, um, in fact, how people, uh, the way that people consume um, the material from the media has changed dramatically. And the people under the age of 30, uh, for people under the age of 30, this discussion is pretty much irrelevant. And so my question to you is, what do, go, going forward, I can understand your advice to the mainstream media, but do you have any thoughts about what we do in the world when actually large proportion uh, are not taking their information from the mainstream media? Yeah, no, it's a wonderful question, and I think also one of the big empirical challenges for us as a field right now. So on the one hand, there is an assumption indeed, uh, and also hard evidence that young people are not turning to the broadsheet newspapers, for sure. At the same time, they are in a communication environment where they spend more than nine hours a day being online on average. This is an average. Um, there is actually a great opportunity and quite a lot of uh, circumstantial exposure to news. This is one of the things that we are only at the beginning of understanding as scholars. So take, let's take Facebook for an example. That's a platform with two billion users. As a scholarly community, we have almost no understanding of how the platform works. It's not going to come from collaboration with the platform itself. It is maybe going to come from uh, the authority that comes after regulation is being considered for the uh, platform to at least be uh, transparent and open about how their algorithm actually works, what kind of political ads that they show. But one of the big unknowns of that change that you're describing, and especially the, say, the 18 to 30 bracket, is that we really don't know how much they are really exposed to. We have an underlying fear that it is not a lot. Uh, however, on platforms such as Facebook, and even on some of the more flimsier social media platforms such as Snapchat, there's a lot of information sharing. We have too little information to really assess how much of that has any political relevance or any public information relevance. That's my first uh, part of the question uh, or answer, answer to, to, your, to your question. The second one is that We've seen also in previous generations that there's a huge socialization effect, and, may, effect, and maybe what we've become accustomed to is a generation that was exceptional in many ways in terms of its level of, of, uh, of being exposed to public information, namely part of also this generation that is in the room that was at the height of the, of the newspaper publishers, uh, and maybe we also simply having to get used to that we are in a different era where this happens on different platforms and maybe not with the same level of detail detail in the breadth of the, of the sense uh, as it was in the past, but more in the depth of some areas. The opportunity today, of course, also to self-select and get much more in-depth information about areas that you really care about is also tremendously much higher. So I would consider myself somewhat uh, agnostic almost as to whether we should be depressed or not tonight on a, on a question like that. Uh, it is sure that there's a massive migration uh, taking place, and it is also a fact that we are currently, as a scholarly community, not well equipped to answer these uh, questions systematically and empirically.